Good morning. Let's open this morning's service with number 69 in the hardback hymnal. 69. Let's all stand together. words were not corrected in your hymnal, um, feel free to open your hymnals back up to 69 and change that word Sabbath to Lord's Day. Uh, we know in light of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished that he himself is our Sabbath. He is our rest. And uh, we're uh, <clears throat> We're not bound to those old Sabbatarian laws and regulations of the old covenant. Uh, we come together on the Lord's Day uh, to worship him and uh, to glory in his resurrection and to rest in him uh, as our hope. So... <clears throat> We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians this morning, if you'd like to turn with me there in your Bibles. And before we begin, I'd like for us to go before the Lord and ask his blessings on our time together. Our Heavenly Father, in your merciful providence, you have brought us from our homes and gathered us together in this place. Lord, you've promised that when your children come together that you will meet with them. Lord, we, we rest our hope in the, in the faithfulness of you and your promises. And Lord, we ask that you would be pleased this hour to open the windows of heaven. We 
pray that you would open your word, open the eyes of our understanding, open our hearts, open, Lord, what no man can shut, and reveal to us the glory of thy dear Son, and give us grace to find our rest and all the hope of our salvation in him. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the two great wings of the eagle that you have given to your church who has fled into the wilderness to find the place that you've prepared for her. Lord, we pray for those in our fellowship that you have afflicted with troubles and trials and ask, Lord, that they would find your grace to be sufficient for them in all their needs. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> we spent several months in the book of Colossians, and uh, what a blessing uh, that was. And now we're, if the Lord's pleased, going to begin a study this first hour in the book of First Thessalonians. And I would encourage you to just take a few minutes sometime today or soon and read these, these two epistles, First and Second Thessalonians. They're very brief, uh, and uh, you'll be encouraged uh, to, to read them. Uh, these, these believers were going through uh, great trials and troubles and persecutions and both of these epistles are words of comfort. Uh, they tell us that this would have been the Apostle Paul's very first epistle that he wrote to the churches. And uh, so uh, this would have been on his second missionary journey. I've titled this message, The Church. Um, we'll read just verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus, which is another word for Silas, and Timotheus, Timothy, unto the church, the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to introduce this message on the church by quoting a very familiar passage of scripture, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And that verse tells us, for you know, you know that all things work together for good for them that love God and those that are the called according to his purpose. And the child of God finds great comfort in that when it comes to the, uh, the circumstances of their own life, uh, things that they can't understand, things they can't explain, trials that are a burden. Uh, we know that our God is sovereignly ordaining and working together all things for our good and for our salvation, for the good of those who love him for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. But I want you to think with me for a moment beyond your own personal circumstances and understand that verse of scripture in light of all of history. If you think about the word history, uh, from the very beginning of time to the end of time, history is his story. And we know that all things, things in your life and uh, things that aren't necessarily directly affecting you as you understand them, things in the past and things in the future, all things, he is working together for good for them that love him and for those that are the called according to his purpose. Now, who are they that love him? The church. 
They are the called out ones. And that's what the word church means. The church means called out to an assemble, uh, to assemble together. And, uh, and that's who we are. And so what I want you to understand at the very beginning here is that our God is working all things together for the good of his church. Uh, the reason for everything, the reason for everything is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God did prior to the cross and everything that has happened since the cross. And we know that he hath done all things <laughs> well. And uh, that that the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, <laughs> uh, things in heaven and all things upon the earth, uh, he is working uh, as a result of the cross. And the purpose of the cross is the salvation of God's elect. Now here's the point. <laughs> here's the point. Child of God, part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Everything that God is doing and everything that is being done, God's doing it, is for the purpose of his church. I believe that. Ah, when the very last one of God's elect are called out of darkness, into his marvelous light, this world will have no more reason to exist. It will come to its end instantly. <laughs> the only purpose that this world serves is the salvation of God's people. So, when the Lord... When the Lord talks about his church, um, <clears throat> there is, there's really nothing else. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the reason for everything. The reason for everything. Now, if you'll uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 17, we'll see how the Lord, in his ordained purpose, in his ordained purpose, and I would remind you again that the word plan is nowhere to be found in the word of God. Uh, Men talk about God's plan for this and God's plan for that as if he, you know, is, uh, has a plan A and a plan B and they talk about uh, man's perfect will versus man, uh, God's perfect will versus God's permissive will. That's, none of that's true. None of that's true. Our God is a God of purpose. Again, let me, let me remind you of Romans 8, 28. For you know, you know this, all things work together for good for them that love God and those that are the called according to his purpose. <laughs> so our God is a God of purpose. Everything he's doing in your life and everything he's done in the history of this world is for the purpose of glorifying Christ is for the purpose of the salvation of his people. And that's the only purpose it serves. And there's no such thing as God's permissive will. I read an article recently where, God, where somebody wrote something about God's permissive will. There's no such thing. Uh, there's the secret will of God. <laughs> Scripture says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things that have been revealed belong to us and to our children. Uh, 
There's much that God's doing that we don't understand, but we know for what purpose it serves. And then there are those things that have been revealed in God's word that, uh, that we bow to. But this idea that God has a plan or that God has a permissive will is, uh, is contrary to the nature of our God. Our God is a God of purpose, and everything he's doing, he is doing on purpose and for a purpose. And so the Apostle Paul, in chapter 16 of Acts, is on his second missionary journey, and he's in uh, what would we know as modern-day Turkey, uh, Asia Minor, and he's asking the Lord if he should go further into Asia. And the scripture says that he was forbid by the Holy Spirit to go east. And, uh, and in that same vision, uh, the scripture says that a man of Macedonia appeared unto him and pleaded with him to come to Macedonia and to help them. And so the Apostle Paul understood that as God's purpose. He was trying to discern the purpose of God and asked the Lord what he should do. And the Lord showed him. Um, I have a people that I've elected in the covenant of grace that are over here in Macedonia. And uh, they're the ones that you're going to take the gospel to. <laughs> and so what a... What a great hope. Our Lord knows where every one of his sheep are. And uh, he's not going to lose a single one of them. He's going to get the gospel to them or he's going to get them to the gospel one way or the other. And uh, the Holy Spirit will forbid uh, uh, the, the gospel in going one way and direct it in another way. For what purpose? The salvation of God's people. Uh, that's it. Uh, and so Paul understands this vision in chapter 16 that the Lord's given him. And so he goes to Macedonia and the first city that he goes to is the city of Philippi. And Philippi is where uh, Lydia was and Philippi is where the Philippian jailer was and there was a, a great saving of God's people in Philippi. The, word, the book to the Philippians was written to the church in Philippi and, uh, and a riot breaks out in Philippi and they, and they run the Apostle Paul out of town and when he leaves Philippi he goes to Thessalonica uh, which is also in Macedonia. And chapter 17 of Acts. And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, as Paul's habit was, the Lord told him, you go, in, you go from, from the Jews to the Gentiles, that the gospel was to go first to the Jews. And so the Apostle Paul, when he went somewhere, if there was a synagogue or an assembly of Jews, he preached the gospel first to them. They had the scriptures. They, they were the ones that were to hear this message first. And so he goes into the synagogue, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. <laughs> now that was, that was what the Jews didn't believe. They had the scriptures. Uh, they didn't have Christ. Uh, they did not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah, that he was the Savior of Israel that he had actually accomplished the salvation of God's people. And, uh, and so Paul takes the scriptures, and all the, he, all the scriptures he had was, as I already mentioned, the book of Thessalonians, first letter that he wrote, so there's nothing uh, yet written in terms of the epistles. The gospels have not been written. All he had was the Old Testament, and so he alleges from the scriptures, from the Old Testament, that Jesus is the Christ. That's what we do every time we come together. We allege 
And we prove from the scriptures that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the successful, sovereign savior of sinners. <laughs> uh, he is the reason for everything. And uh, by God's grace, we seek to lift him up. And God's people will be saved. And some of them believed, this is always the response to the gospel, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks of great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. And so not just the Jews believed, but some of the Greeks. This would have been a city mixed of Jews and Gentiles. And the Lord has a people uh, among both groups. And so... They hear the gospel, and by God's grace, they're brought to believe what's being said about Christ. But the Jews which believe not, believing not, is always an act of defiance. It's always a willing act of unbelief. To believe not is to, is to make a decision not to believe. On the other hand, to believe is a passive act. <laughs> it's a work done to you. <laughs> and so the ones who believe the gospel have had the Spirit of God making them willing in the day of his power, opening the eyes of their understanding and giving to them faith. To believe not the gospel is a, is a decision to, to not believe God. Consequently, men who believe not bear the full responsibility of their unbelief. And they will stand without excuse before God. And they who believe will know that the faith that they have was given to them of God, that a man can receive nothing except to be given to him from heaven, that this faith is a gift of God and that he gets all the praise and all the glory. It was a work of grace done to them. <clears throat> Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas of the devout Jews and a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews which believed not were moved with envy. And here's the reason why men won't believe the gospel. They will not have their glory taken from them. <laughs> they'll not be brought to bow and to submit. They, they'll raise their fist to heaven and say, we'll not have that man to reign over us. Uh, they're envious of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ gets all the credit and all the glory and all the praise for their salvation and they have no contribution whatsoever to make. <laughs> uh, men... Men by nature uh, envy God, and uh, they will not. They were moved with envy. And so they took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city up on, a, up on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now clearly these were some of the Jews that had stirred up trouble in Philippi. They followed Paul. And, uh, and they're now accusing the apostle Paul of turning the world upside down. <laughs> oh, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are higher above the, hev above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. God's ways are just contrary to ours. It's not that we have to have our understanding tweaked in order to know God. Uh, we, have to, we have to have a complete change of mind, a complete change of heart. <laughs> A complete change of direction 
everything that we believe about God and about salvation is wrong by nature. Everything we believe. Um, and, and, and so what we call upside down, <laughs> God's saying is right side up. Now, what are they? They're accusing the Apostle Paul of turning the world upside down. The truth is, the world was already upside down. <laughs> the gospel is the only thing that turns the world upside, right side up. This is the upside down world we live in. Everything's backwards. Everything's contrary to the truth. Everything's wrong. <laughs> it's only the gospel that makes sense of anything. And it makes sense of everything. It causes us to see that, that God has one purpose. He has one purpose. The salvation of his people is the reason why the world exists. And he, and he saves his people by glorifying his son. The cross is what it's, is, is, is well, it's, it's the reason for everything. But here's the natural thinking of man. Those who stand in rebellion against God, those who envy the glory that God gets in salvation, those who will not bow, those who will not believe, those who have decided they're going to have it their way, uh, which we all would, lest God made us to differ. Who made you to differ? <laughs> That's a good question. What do you have that you did not receive? <laughs> you didn't earn it. You didn't decide to have it. It was given to you as a free gift. So when we speak of the rebellion of the natural man, we know that but for the grace of God, there go I. And, uh, and so accusing the Apostle Paul of turning the world upside down. And when Jason, verse 7, hath whom Jason hath received. Jason had received the Apostle Paul into his home. And so Jason was a local and they were going to attack him first. And these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. The same accusation the Jews made about Christ. Uh, same reason why Pilate asked the Lord, are you the king of the Jews? That's the accusation they're making against you, that you are uh, threatening the authority of Caesar and that you're trying to rob from Caesar his, his kingdom. And what did our Lord say? My kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my disciples would fight. But for this cause was I born. And for this purpose came I into the world, that I might bear witness unto the truth. And they that are of the truth hear my voice and they follow me. That's what it's all about, the truth. Nothing else matters. And what did Pilate say in response to that? You know, relativism is not a new thing. You hear men today say, well, what's true for you may not be true for me. And, you know, I see it this way and you see it that way. And everybody's got an opinion. And we got, you know, uh, thousands of religious uh, groups and organizations around the world. And everybody's got a little bit of truth. And it's all relative to whatever you think truth is. That's the way the world thinks about truth. And when the Lord Jesus Christ said to Pilate, for this cause came I into the world to bear witness unto the truth. And they that are of the truth hear my voice and they follow me. He was speaking of himself as the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And what did Pilate say? 
He said exactly the same thing men say today. Truth? <laughs> Truth? Is that what this whole uproar is about? Don't you know that there's no such thing as an absolute truth? Don't you know that everything is relative? This is about truth? Yes, it's about truth. It is about truth. And Christ is that truth. And outside of him, there is no truth. And they're, they're, accusing, they're accusing Paul and Jason they knew that the way to get the governing authorities on their side and get rid of Paul was to accuse him of, of, of challenging the, the authority of Rome. And verse 8, And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security, that word means bail, they had already been put in prison. Now the believers are going to get together and, uh, and pay their bail to get them out. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. <laughs> goes from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea. What's he doing? Preaching the gospel. God had said to him, go to Macedonia. I have a people over there. They need your help. They need to hear the truth. And, uh, and they will hear it. But in hearing it, there's going, to be some, there's going to be some persecution. Now, the Apostle Paul was in Thessalonica three Sabbath days, three weeks. Three weeks, that was it. And he preached the gospel faithfully those three weeks, and God raised up a church. And then he goes to Berea and ends up in Athens, and when he's in Athens, he writes the letter back and sends, and sends uh, Timothy back to, uh, to encourage them. Now, if you go back with me to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul and Silas and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> the church of the Lord Jesus Christ exists in two places. It exists in two places. I'm not talking about existing in two physical locations here on earth. I'm talking about the fact that there is a church in heaven and that there are local assemblies on the earth. When the Bible speaks of the church, it's speaking of both. That eternal church, that invisible church, that church where the names of all those whom God chose in the covenant of grace are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is the church. Turn to me to Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you a verse of scripture here. In Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 22. But you are come not to Mount Sinai, not to the law, but to Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. And by that is a reference to his resurrection. And so he is the firstborn. And we have the hope of our salvation in his conquering of death. 
So we've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So all the people of God have always been in Christ, and they've always been in heavenly places. Child of God, when you close your eyes in death, and God sends his angels to take you into glory. You're not going to open your eyes in heaven and, 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 and be comparing what you're seeing to what you just came out of. No, you will have no memory whatsoever of this life. You will come to the realization that you've always been there. Time will be no more. This idea that people in heaven die and they look back on the earth, that's that heaven would not be heaven if we had any memory whatsoever or any thoughts in heaven of this life. We've always been there. And we are there now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. If anything is a figment of our imagination, it is this life <laughs> <laughs> if anything is not is is less than completely real and true it is our existence in this world <laughs> you see the the real existence we have is eternal the eternal church uh, the heavenly jerusalem so when god speaks of his church he's talking about all of those whom the father chose in christ before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Not a single person can be added to that church. When David said in those last words, you remember he said, although my house be not so with God, uh, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. He's looking back to that eternal covenant of grace as the hope of his salvation, that promise that God made to save a people, not his promises to God, but God's promise to him. There's our hope. Yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, and that covenant is ordered in all things. And sure, everything necessary to fulfill that covenant was ordered in what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he died on Calvary's cross, when he put away our sins. And his ascension back into glory. The word of God did not return to him void. He took with him the names of those for whom he lived and died. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. This is where the church is. And what is the last thing that David says in that confession? Although he make it not to grow. <laughs> you know, in the world... In the religious world, church growth is a great big thing. You know, how to plant churches, how to grow churches. how to... The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has never grown by one member. And it's never been depleted by one member. The Lord said hey, he, he'll not lose one of his sheep. <laughs> this is the eternal church. This is the church that is sure and steadfast, the secure church of God in heaven. And so when we speak of the church, we're talking about that church. And then we're also talking about the local assemblies, which are much different from the eternal church. The local assemblies are visible. Local assemblies are temporal. You go to any of these cities that we've been talking about this morning in the Middle East right now, and you won't find a gospel church. Those churches didn't last long. Um, they, he, God raises up a church, <laughs> and, uh, and he'll bless that church for a period of time, and then, and then he'll withdraw his hand from that church. That's our greatest fear, isn't it? Lord, don't, don't remove your presence from us. Uh, we, we, 
what will we do if we don't have if we don't have a place to meet, if we don't have a place to to hear, a place to worship? And all the churches in the New Testament were particular locations. The church which is at Thessalonica, the church which was at Philippi, the church which was at Rome, the church which was at Corinth. And so the reference there is to a visible temporal church. And the Lord tells us that these, that these visible temporal churches are made up of wheat and tares. There are believers and unbelievers, unlike the church in heaven which is only made up of God's elect. The temporal, visible churches here on the earth are made up of believers and unbelievers. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to know the difference, isn't it? Uh, even for ourselves, it's hard. Lord, don't, don't let me be a tear among the wheat. We're not to go around tearing up the, pulling up the tares. We'll damage the wheat if we do that. They grow up together. In the day of harvest, the Lord will, will, will separate the wheat from the tares. Um, and and, and even, among the, even among the wheat, unlike the church in heaven, the temporal church is made up of sinners. Uh, those who are Save those who believe the gospel, those who rest their hope in Christ are also bearing in their bodies a sinful nature that, that, that affects their lives and the lives of others. And so the temporal church, unlike the eternal church, is very fragile. And that's the reason why the Lord says that we're to pray for one another and encourage one another and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is and, 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 and pray for one another and, and seek the peace of God among yourselves and the unity of the brethren. This is all, these are all encouragements given to the local assembly. These things are not necessary in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the eternal church, in the invisible church, the Lord Jesus Christ will be the whole focus of our attention and our glory and our praise and he himself and sin will be no more and time will be no more and we get just a little taste of that here. But the local assembly is a precious thing and it's a it's a fragile thing and uh, is to be treated carefully and gently and we're admonished to seek her peace and to forgive one another and to love one another. <laughs> now, we saw just briefly from the uh, passage we read in Acts chapter 17 that Jason and the other believers were persecuted as a result of their believing the gospel. And, um, and I, I was and if you read the, the, the letters to first and to, to the church at Thessalonica, you'll see that much of Paul's encouragement is in light of the persecutions that they are suffering over the gospel. And how oftentimes we've, we've been thankful that we live in a country where we can meet openly and freely. Uh, we have the freedom of speech. We have the freedom of worship. Uh, we're thankful that our founding fathers saw the need to make this the first of all the, of all the uh, amendments in our Constitution. Um, and yet, something became very clear to me in spending a week with our brother from India last week, uh, Gilbert Dawson. And I shared with you a little bit of some of what they suffer as a result of the gospel in India. And I felt some jealousy 
I felt some envy that, that we, don't, we don't have to suffer that. And the, the sweetness of, their, of their, their faith and their trust and their hope. <laughs> Gilbert, Gilbert sent me a, a, two of the brethren picked him up at the airport when he got home uh, Thursday, this, this, this past Thursday, and he said, I thought they were going to crush me. They hugged me so tight and for so long, I thought they were going to crush me. He was gone for a month, and uh, he was their pastor, and he came home, and they, and they embraced him so. I thought, you know, historically, persecution's been good for the church. What if we've had to meet secretly? What if we had to meet secretly in, in fear of being imprisoned or in being put to death? Uh, I wonder how many of us would, would be there, would, would risk that. Um, you know, we, we, on one hand, we are thankful for the freedoms that we have, but I'm not so sure that it's that much of a blessing. Um, I think that that persecution is a blessing. It certainly has been historically in the church. I mean, the church thrived the first three centuries. Uh, and then when the Roman Emperor Constantine made it an acceptable religion in the Roman government, and then after him, the Roman government made it the state religion, uh, what happened to the gospel? What happened to the gospel when all of a sudden the persecution is no longer... You see, when the, when the original believers in Jerusalem were persecuted, the scripture says they scattered... And as they scattered, it was like putting out a fire. Everywhere those believers went, they took, the, they took a spark of the gospel with them and, they, and a new fire lit. Uh, we become so... I mean, worship is so convenient for us. It's so easy. And... Uh, oh, the... The sweetness that these believers experienced uh, in the trial of their faith, in the opposition of the world against the church was a, was a blessing to them. <clears throat> um, let me close by just making some brief comments about um, the last part of this verse 1. The church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is being in God the Father and being in Christ, not only is there no more secure place to be, being found in God the Father and being found in Christ is the only secure place to be. It is the only secure place to be. There's no security outside of this. What the Lord is telling us is that the church is in the hand of God the Father in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the hand of God the Father. <laughs> no way. No way the church is getting out of that hand. It's the hand of God. Listen to what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 10. He said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall ne never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. And here's the hope that we have. Believer, 
part of the body of Christ, part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the called out ones, the bride of Christ. You can't separate yourself from God. And no amount of persecution and no amount of trials or troubles, nothing the world can do will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God saves his church. They are given eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never perish. Let's take a break.